it's spread all over the world, so now it's a global, a global issue. And it's only because of the use of expensive chemicals, of fungicides, that we're able to combat it. Ireland's landlords no longer have to combat their feisty tenants. Instead of rebellious peasants, why not placid cows and sheep who eat grass, not potatoes? But something else has taken root in Ireland, something dangerous the landlords can't control, a fierce defiance to English rule. The first Irish terrorist movement, the first Irish um, group committed to violence as a means of getting rid of the British out of Ireland, that's where it emerges. If this system allows one million of us to die, you know, what good is it to us? By 1916, rage and bitterness flare into mass protest and guerrilla warfare. The Irish finally win independence in 1921. Today, only Northern Ireland remains under British rule. Flashback to 1848. Forget the future. The Nerys don't believe they have one. For Bartholomew Nery, the outlook at home is too grim. The lure of America, too strong. All that's left is to say goodbye. A million are dead. Now a million farewells cut a scar as deep as death itself. Give us another tune there, let's. So if you went from Roscommon to America, you know, that was it. You didn't come back. In a new twist on the traditional funeral wake, the family gathers in a ritual known as an American way. You see, these rituals actually transfer to the living person. And it's as if the corpse is actually alive, but that corpse is now the emigrant. They gathered with their friends before they departed to, to the new world. They gathered uh, to celebrate, but also to lament the departure of some of their family and their friends. You could sum it up this way. A million dead, a million fled. That makes one out of every four gone. You translate those numbers to America today, and all of California, Michigan, Illinois, and New York State would be emptied out. Bartholomew Neri sets out towards his last ditch hope, America. But for him and countless others, a distant dream is about to turn into reality. Today, one American will take the journey in reverse, his dream to find his roots in the green hills of Ireland. April 17, 1848. Bartholomew Nery steps off the boat in Manhattan and swaps Ireland's abandoned fields for New York's gridlock. In the next dozen years, a million Irish arrive in New York, and they keep on coming. They were facing extraordinary discrimination in my own city of Boston. I have um, a little uh, uh, placard that I remember was my mother and father's house that said, no Irish need apply, I still have it in uh, our house. That was um, a, something that was very real. One of the miracles of the famine is that America didn't close its doors. Some of the poorest, in many cases, disease-stricken people that they'd ever seen pour in in almost incomprehensible numbers into New York, into Philadelphia, into Boston. And into cholera-infested slums. In one New York neighborhood, there's only a single bathtub for every thousand residents. In one Irish slum, a third of all babies die before their first birthday. In Boston, Philadelphia, and Chicago, poverty rules. But old blood ties carve out new home turf. One street you will find they're all County Ross common people. 
The next street you'll find they're all County Tyrone people. They're recreating in America what had been kind of shattered back home. Ties of kinship and neighborhood come into being. I think there was a sense of a real kind of hope that, that everything was going to be better, and, but they learned very quickly that uh, the, the only jobs that were really open to them were the more menial jobs, the laboring jobs. Bartholomew Neri leaves New York. By 1850, his name turns up on the census rolls in Rutland, Vermont. Occupation, laborer. In Chicago, his cousin Edward also breaks a sweat. He helps dig the Illinois and Michigan Canal. Soon, he opens a boarding house. And there's no lack of customers. An army of Irish muscle will pump up the nation and help build the transcontinental railroad. In Utah, one crew lays 10 miles of track in a single day. And as trains hurtle west, new cities sprout faster than potatoes. So you go to Rock Springs, Wyoming, and there's a big Irish population. If you go to Butte, Montana, it's all Irish. Now that's where many of those that have been building the, the, the railroads have stopped and actually settled. You can look at these pockets of Irish all across the country, including many of the great cities, Chicago, San Francisco, and the rest. By 1900, there are more Irish in Chicago and New York than there are in Dublin. Out of the famine, they bring a hunger for justice and the guts to fight for their rights. Politics was the venue which uh, the Irish saw that they could uh, emerge uh, to being uh, important forces in terms of the, uh, the country and its uh, leadership, primarily in the Democratic uh, Party. A few became uh, misinformed and joined the Republicans, but we've, uh, we can understand that. Within a generation, both Chicago and New York have an Irish mayor. And soon, a family of famine survivors becomes America's first family. It took 115 years to make this trip, 6,000 miles, and three generations. When uh, my great-grandfather left here to become a uh, cooper in East Boston, he carried uh, nothing with him except two things, a strong religious faith and a strong uh, desire for liberty. He came back and the first night he said, do you want to come back to my house? I had the films of Ireland. We all went over, the family, there about 30 of us went over. The next night we were over at my brother Bobby's house. He said, uh, does anybody want to go back over to my house? I've got a show. What are you showing? The trip to Ireland. So that night there were about five of us who went back. And then Sunday night he said, anybody for Ireland? And he showed it again. It was really, I think, uh, the, the time that he enjoyed the most uh, uh, when he was president. In Ballykilcline, the story of another family, this one almost forgotten, finally sees the light of day. Finding the artifacts is just the beginning of the detective work because that's the first phase. That's the act of discovery itself. For thousands of Americans in search of their roots, the act of discovery starts in a very different way. And I believe I found my family, my family heritage. Thousands of immigrants left Ireland on leaky sailing ships. Now their descendants return on the wind. Dennis Shanley, along with his friend Maureen McDermott, has come to retrace the steps his ancestors took. Dennis and Maureen have lived the American dream. Now they're tracing their roots back to the home of those who dared to dream. After a century and a half of separation, the great silence ends the way it began, with an embrace. My great, great, great grandfather was Mark Neary. He had two, three sons. He had Luke, he had Edward, and he had James. Edward was my great, great grandfather. And we believe that James was your great, great grandfather. For Americans like Dennis, James Neary could be the only link to those who stayed behind. 
but he'll have to find him first. This is James, Edwards and Luke's brother. James yeah. stayed behind. And he died April of 1860. You gotta feel <laughs> some of it's the like engraving. Real. You can't Take read it. 1867, mm -hmm. at age 65. If this is the James, which it's, it's gotta be. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be. The Nerys are gone, but they left a message. A century and a half later, it reaches their great, great, great grandson. This is the thimble here that we found. It was at this okay. site. Yes. <coughs> Look at that. It's beautiful. Look. Oh, it's brilliant. I've got goosebumps. Yeah, quite a <laughs> forget me not. Wonderful. Touching the thimble was absolutely wonderful. Uh, to know that most likely one of my ancestors, most likely my great-great-grandmother, it belonged to her, is, is, is a comfortable, warm, serene feeling, a sad feeling, to think about what those people went through. It's very sad. It's very sad. Forget me not. It just sums, sums it all up. They have definitely not been forgotten. Definitely not been forgotten. Across the threshold of memory lies a moment in time of anguish and resistance, starvation and cruelty. From out of the ashes, a few diehard rebels fought for survival in their own land and built a new one in America.